If you have your Bibles, please turn it, turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 5. You can also grab a Bible from the pew. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to look at the first part of verse 14. And please stand for the reading of God's word. 1 Peter chapter 5. And here's the first part of the verse. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Let me read it again. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, you are holy You are other, you are different, and greater than anything we can even understand or comprehend. Lord, I ask that this morning, by your Holy Spirit, that you would help us, that you would lift our eyes above the earthly plane, that we would catch a glimpse, Lord, into the nature of who you are, And Lord, we thank you that we can be here. We thank you that we can be reminded every week together of who you are and that we can praise you and that we can hear from your word. And Lord, I pray that as we turn our attention to the scriptures, Lord, that you would help us, that you would give us ears, that you would give us attention, Lord, that you would open our hearts, that we could receive your holy word and that it would teach us and instruct us and and change us and let your character become a part of our character. Father, help us and glorify your name in us and through us. And please help me speak this morning. Help us all to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my sermon this morning is What's in a Greeting? And the brief answer to that question, what's in a greeting, is it depends. It depends. Either nothing really is in a greeting. It's just a humdrum social convention. It's just a formality. And there's really nothing that significant about a greeting at all. Or if you read some of these you know, business magazines and things, they'll say, well, a lot is in a greeting. A greeting is a slick networking gimmick for the ambitious, right? If you really want to get ahead in life, you better greet people because you better know how to greet them because that's going to make a big difference in your career and in your success. So really, what's in a greeting? Well, it's, it's for your sake to get ahead. It's a networking gimmick. Or when we look at the Bible, I think we can say something like this. Everything is in a greeting. The gospel is in a greeting. God is in a greeting. And if we look at this verse, holiness is in a greeting. Love is in a greeting. And this simple idea of a greeting that we all think we understand, or yeah, I know what a greeting is, it turns out, according to the Bible, this very simple thing and very common thing in the world becomes one of the most profound and powerful things in the world. And consequently, a true biblical greeting is something that's all too rare in the world. Now, friends, I am convinced, and I've seen this before, that the Bible's counsel concerning greetings, like its counsel on anything, has the potential to change your life, to change the lives of those around you, to change the church, to change the community, and to transform us 
if we are willing to open our hearts and receive the counsel of God and what he has to say. Two kinds of people in the world, according to the Bible. There are the wise and there are the foolish. And the wise are those who heed counsel and heed instruction and they're willing to learn and they listen. And they say, oh, if the Bible says this, then I'm going to listen to that because that's coming from God and God is wise and God knows better than I do. The foolish person, of course, says, no, I don't really care for that or I don't think that makes sense to me or I don't really like that or that makes me uncomfortable and so I'm not going to change and consequently the foolish person comes to ruin or comes to nothing. This biblical counsel on greeting can change your life and the life of the community if we will listen to it. This morning, I'm going to do two things in this sermon. First of all, we're going to explore what the Bible has to say about greetings. And my hope is that after this exploration, you're going to realize the significance of a greeting. And, and after this sermon, I hope that you'll not think about greetings again in the same way. You'll take this with you for the rest of your life. And after we explore what the Bible has to say about greetings... And it will have to be cursory, of course, because we only have so much time. I'm going to finish with several exhortations for us about greetings. I'm going to give us some, I'm going to give us some challenges and some practical tips on greeting based upon what we learn. So number one, exploring what the Bible has to say about greetings. The word greet and its cognates are found over 70 times in the New Testament alone. Now, the, New, the New Testament is not an enormously large book. 70 times in the New Testament, the apostles write the word greet or greetings or greet or something like that. To put that into a little bit of perspective, the word joy is used 75 times. So we're getting up there with some pretty significant words when we're talking about greeting. Or if you were to take this 70, this number 70, and kind of diffuse it all throughout the New Testament and spread it out and flatten it out, you'd be, you'd be running into the word greet three times every chapter if it could be spread out like that as you read the New Testament. So it's kind of amazing that in the New Testament, which is a book that's dealing with God and that's dealing with hu humanity and, and the relationship between God and humanity, it's dealing with the themes of the wrath of God and the love of God and the judgment of God in heaven and hell and eternity. The apostles take a lot of time to talk about greeting. They take up a lot of precious papyrus to talk about greeting. They continually are bringing this up in their letters, not only telling us to greet one another, but also modeling it. Aren't, do you remember how they model it? These are inspired apostles. Because ultimately what we're dealing with is with in this book is the inspired word of God. This is, this is the Holy Spirit's voice speaking to us. And the Holy Spirit wants us to hear a lot about greeting. The Holy Spirit wants us to be told to greet. The Holy Spirit wants to tell us to greet one another. The Holy Spirit wants to instruct us on how to greet one another. And the Holy Spirit also wants to give us examples and model what that looks like. So we'll have stories about that in the Bible as well. So please mark that in your, in your heart and in your mind that God wants you to think about greeting and to be one who greets. Rajesh, Rajesh Gandhi, an Indian Christian minister, is right when he observes that the exhortation to greet is a vital scriptural instruction. Do you believe that? When you think of the command to greet one another with a kiss of love, and you kind of organize your ethical system, is, is greet one another kind of up there with love God and love your neighbor as yourself? Or is greet one another kind of at the bottom with like, when you're going to sacrifice a pigeon, make sure it's not blemished in any way, <laughs> right? I suspect for some people, greet one another is down there with, if you're going to sacrifice a pigeon, make sure it's not blemished in any way, right? It's kind of like one of those commands that aren't relevant to, to you, right? Yeah, yeah, it's there in the Bible, but yeah, it doesn't have importance to me. I think as you'll see as we go on, the command to greet one another with a kiss of love is actually up there with love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I think a lot of us may need to do some organizing, reorganizing in our ethical understanding. 
The Greek word for greet is aspazomai. It's an interesting word. It, it actually means, it literally means to enfold in one's arms, to embrace. A true greeting is recognizing the presence of a person and extending welcome to that person. Whether you physically welcome them and enfold them in your arms or whether you just kind of communicate welcome to them in your, in your body language, in your voice, in your eyes, it's not simply recognizing the presence of another person and saying, I see you standing there, right? But it's communicating, I see you as a valuable and significant person and I welcome you into my presence, and I'm glad that you're here. That's what a true greeting is. Now, many of us, I think, when we greet, we may just do the, I recognize your presence, but there's no welcome. Hi. And it communicates, there's no, I'm glad you're here, right? Many of us don't even recognize the presence of another person, which is even worse, I think. Can you imagine? You're in a physical space with another person, and you don't even recognize them. They're like uh, the, the furniture in the room. How many want to be recognized and welcomed by God? I know we all do, right? And I know I do. I don't want an angel to go to God in heaven and say, you know, Eli was doing something such and such, and God said, hold on a minute, who's Eli? Oh, yeah, that's right. And the beautiful thing, what we find in the nature of God, in what we see in the Bible, is that the gospel reveals that God not only recognizes you and your presence on earth, but he welcomes you as well. That God, what did Jesus say to those who actually didn't love him and rejected him? He said, with tears, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You see, the willingness was not on Christ's part or on God's part. God, this is the wonderful good news that we as Christians believe and proclaim, isn't it? God sees you, he recognizes you, he knows you, he knows your name, he knows everything about you, and he's glad you're here. And he welcomes you, he greets us. And we're glad God is like that, aren't we? We sing in a song, a beloved song, though Satan should buffet and trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. So these commands to greet one another show us the essence and the flavor of Christianity. Christianity is about the love of God and it's about relationship, first of all, within, within God. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit love each other and have relationship with one another and recognize each other's presence and welcome one another. So even before we existed, there was relationship. And then relationship between God and man. Recognition and welcome and love. And also relationship, welcome and love between human and human, person and person. Reflecting the love of God towards each other and demonstrating the nature of God through each other. Greetings matter, as one pastor put it, because people matter. Greetings matter because people matter. So if you, if you aren't into greetings, guess what? You aren't into people. And if you aren't into people, then your priorities are not God's priorities. Everyone has a basic desire and need to be acknowledged as significant. True? Anyone not have that desire? Everyone has a basic desire and need to be acknowledged and, as significant. Everyone has a need to be acknowledged, their presence 
and to be welcomed. Why is that? Because everyone is significant. This isn't one of those desires that we need to come along and squash and say, you know, you shouldn't even desire to be recognized. No, you're supposed to be recognized because you are significant, because you are made in the image of God. You're not a piece of furniture. And the world is wrong when a person is not recognized and welcomed. True? The world is wrong when a person is not recognized and welcomed. And you know, furthermore, a church is wrong when a person is not recognized and welcomed. The world is wrong, but the world's going to probably do that. But when the church doesn't recognize people's presence and welcome them and, and say, you're welcome here and we're glad you're here and we see you and we care about you, something is seriously wrong with that church. A church that does not greet one another is like the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2. Yeah, you may have really good doctrine, the, uh, Jesus says to that church, but you've left your first love. You've left the love that you had at first. God greets us, brothers and sisters and friends. How do we know God greets us? Ultimately, because Christ died for us, and the death of Christ is simply the inevitable culmination of God's care for us since the beginning that he's demonstrated. I'd like us to look at some verses that draw out the significance of greetings. Please turn in your Bibles to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. Just look at two verses here. Genesis 37. Look at verse 3 and 4. It's a familiar story, I'm sure. Joseph and his brothers. Now Israel loved Joseph. This is Genesis 37, verse 3. Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored coat. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. And so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Now the Hebrew word on friendly terms is actually the word shalom, which means peace. They could not speak shalom to him. They could not speak peace to him. And the commentator Carl Keel observes, quote, they could not ask him how he was or offer him the usual salutation, peace be with thee. Because that's the usual salutation, isn't it, in the Hebrew world, is shalom. In the Middle East, shalom, peace. That's how you greet somebody. It's, it's not merely recognizing their presence, but it's also saying, I recognize your presence and I wish you well. And they couldn't do that. So picture Joseph and his brothers now. Whenever Joseph came along, his brothers weren't like, hey, Joseph, how are you? Hey, Joseph, peace, shalom. They couldn't do that. They probably just ignored him, maybe kind of grunted at him or whatever. And he probably felt that, that they would not greet him. They could not greet him because they hated him. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not simply what you say to somebody that reveals the status of your relationship with them, but also what you don't say. You can't greet somebody. That's a problem. No greeting, no love. Now, it could be no time, right? I didn't get to greet you because I ran out of time and I couldn't get to you. That's true. But if there was time, if there was opportunity... No greeting, no love, no care. Because what we don't say matters. Something is wrong. Something is seriously wrong if you cannot genuinely greet somebody. A greeting communicates two things, at least. The status of your relationship. What's the status of this relationship right now? What's the current feeling we have towards one another and to the immediate potential of the relationship based upon how somebody greets you you get an indication of what's possible in that relationship at that at that time is the door open is the door closed are the arms open or are the arms folded 
So you learn a lot from a greeting. And you learn a lot from a non-greeting as well. In other words, whether you greet, my friends, or whether you don't greet, you're communicating something. You just can't escape it. You're always communicating your status, the relationship status, and the potential of the relationship, whether you're greeting or whether you're not. Can't, can't run, can't hide. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And we'll look at verse 46 to 48. Matthew 5, 46 to 48. Now here's Jesus speaking. And he says this in verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, if you still didn't think greetings was important, then I hope that this passage has changed your mind. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? He's connecting greeting with love, isn't he? He's putting love and greeting together. He's, he's basically saying something parallel. He's saying, if you love only those who love you, what do you do different? If you greet only those who are your friends and brothers, what do you do? So he's putting greeting and love together. No greeting, no love. But even more than that, he's putting greeting and God together. If you don't greet others, or if you only greet your friends, then you aren't like God who recognizes and welcomes all. Wow. And Jesus is actually saying this is, this is what people will be, you know, this is, this is what it means to love people. So, you know, don't delude yourself of ideas of how loving you are unless, you've, unless you greet others. And he ties it to God because this is what God is like. See, Jesus thinks a lot differently than most of us in this world. You know who, who loved greetings? Jesus said the Pharisees loved greetings. Why do, the, why do the Pharisees love greetings? Well, they loved greetings because people were recognizing them and welcoming them. People were treating them as significant. People were treating them as important. And so when a Pharisee came into the, into the room or into the, you know, the area, people would kind of go over and say, hello, welcome, we're glad you're here. And boy, did they love that. Of course they loved it. Who doesn't want to be recognized and welcomed? But other people wouldn't get that same recognition and welcome. And Jesus is saying, God recognizes everybody and welcomes everybody. And guess what? His recognition and welcome of us is undeserved. It's not based on merit. It's based on the love of God for us. And so ought we to love and greet others. Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. And then after this passage, we'll go back to 1 Peter and we'll look at some exhortation. Draw some practical points. Luke chapter 22, verse 47. And we'll look at verse 47 and 48 of Luke 22. Verse 47, while Jesus was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. 
and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I think this is an extremely profound moment in the Bible and in history where the significance of what greetings is is shown. You know, if you had any doubt about the significance of a greeting, I think this moment should open our eyes. Because Judas is coming toward Jesus to greet him in a, probably a way that Judas had greeted Jesus many, many times. They come in, they embrace, they kiss. It's natural in that culture. And Jesus stops him. Do you notice that? But Jesus said, Judas... And I get the sense here that Jesus is incredulous. Incredulous, meaning he can't believe Judas is doing this. He's incredulous at the thoughtlessness and the vileness, I don't think of merely Judas, but of the human heart that Judas is displaying at this moment. You know, Jesus came from heaven, and he came into this earth and all the things that Jesus experienced were not like heaven. The treatment he received from human beings. But here, I, I, I get the sense Jesus is almost a little bit really, you know? Could the earth really produce something so vile and thoughtless as this? Something that's so unthinkable with God. Because God would never do that. God would never betray you with a kiss. God would never feign welcome to you, pretend I recognize you and welcome you and come to you, and then, ha-ha, I got you and, and betray you with a kiss. It, Jesus is saying, you would do this, Judas? It's unthinkable to God that you would take something so beautiful and something so holy and something so fitting and right, something that is all about love, recognizing the presence of another person and saying, I'm glad to see you, I'm glad you're here, I wish you well, and using that as the means by which you betray and kill another person? It's despicable. And here's the amazing irony of it all that should just amaze us. The, the God who greets us, the very God who recognizes us in love, and the very God who welcomes us with open arms, the very God who does that even though we don't deserve it, he just does it for love's sake, not because we merit it, but because he just cares for us that God is betrayed with the greeting. The God who greets us in love is betrayed with a greeting. There's so many ironies in the Bible. This is the height of scandal, brothers and sisters and friends, that under the pretense of recognition and welcome, Jesus is pushed away as nothing. With a kiss? I hope that we haven't become so desensitized to greeting and kisses and hugs that we don't see, like Jesus sees, the horror of this. And this shows us to Jesus how profoundly beautiful and significant greetings are. Let's turn to 1 Peter, back to our text. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 14. Based upon this cursory exploration of the Bible, we can say that greetings, though they are simple things, are profound and powerful things. And here's really a takeaway point. Greetings are a gateway. Greetings are a gateway to other things, to other service, to other acts of love. And friends, if you fail here in greeting people, you're going to fail elsewhere in greeting them. If you don't recognize the presence of other people and have a welcoming disposition toward them, well, I don't expect you to do much more for those people, okay? What you do in greeting determines much. And success in the little thing opens up the gate for so much more. I think of a dam that breaks. And you know how dams break? They usually just break in one tiny little spot, right? And then the water starts coming into that one little spot and then it continues to open up and it just, it just continues to move faster and faster until finally the dam can't 
hold it anymore, and the water's just rushing in torrents. But it only started in this one little insignificant spot that probably most people would say, what difference is that little thing going to make? And I think as Christians and as a church, we're always saying, you know, we want to see a great torrent of love and of service. And this is what today is actually all about. A ministry fair, plugging in, serving one another, finding your giftings and doing them. And we want to see, you know, the church active and serving one each other, uh, serving one another and serving the community and doing all these wonderful things. I suggest, if you, I suggest to you if we fail in greeting one another, we, we're not going to ever get that torrent. We may want to see it, but we despise the little thing, right? Oh, what difference is that? We want to see the torrent. We don't want this little thing. And it's the little thing that opens it up, that changes our hearts towards one another, that changes our disposition, that opens our eyes, that helps us start seeing people with the eyes of God. And then everything else can come from that. So by way of exhortation this morning, I'd like to take what we've learned and appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great greeter, and, and challenge us to greet one another. And basically do exactly what Peter's doing here, who commands us to greet one another in love, with a, holy, with a kiss of love. And, here's some, and I want to give some practical tips about that as well. So Peter tells us in verse 14, Greet one another with a kiss of love. And I actually could have gone to many letters and other apostles say the same thing. But I picked here. So number one, ask yourself, how do you greet? How do you greet? Is greeting a formality for you? An expected formality that you just fulfill its social function and there's really nothing more than that to you, to your greeting? Is it just a social function or convention? Is it a networking gimmick? Maybe you're a great greeter outwardly, but internally, it's all for you. It's all just to get ahead with your business. Do you greet at all? Maybe you're one of those people who don't greet anyone except maybe one or two other people and you're out of here. You know, doesn't matter about everybody else. How do you greet? Do you greet with a kiss of love? Now, I'm not going to exhort us this morning to uh, begin kissing each other. Um, as I said, I, I do think this was a cultural thing. It was common for people to kiss one another. And, and what Peter is really saying here is not simply, you know, when you greet, kiss each other. But what he's saying is, when you kiss each other, do it with love, right? You're already greeting and kissing each other, but do it with love. Do it with genuine recognition and welcome. I think it is sad that we don't kiss each other. But we can still show true affection, can't we? We can communicate love for one another through body language, through our words, through our eyes, and through hugs. I was reading um, something from an itinerant minister. His name is Ray Pritchard. He travels all over the world, and he was commenting on how uh, the Christian church in other parts of the world, they are better at expressing affection towards each other. They're better at expressing love and affection towards. It's not that we don't love and love each other here in the West. We're just a little bit more, you know, stayed and, and emotionally wound up or whatever. Uh, but he did say this. He says, we need more hugs in the body of Christ, more open emotion. This is his point. More expressions of caring, more daring to tear down the walls and get close to one another. The bottom line here is that when we greet one another, let it not be a formality, but, gen but let genuine welcome be expressed. That's what Peter's saying. Greet one another with a kiss of love. How you doing with that? Now, Peter tells us to greet one another with a kiss of love. I don't think that means that we need to greet everyone like the prodigal son's father greeted the prodigal son. Okay? You'd get very tired, and I think everyone would think you're weird, right? <laughs> Start crying and fall on their neck and kiss them and stuff, right? So I don't think Peter's saying this. And, and you, know, you don't really love people unless you greet them like that. No, that's not what's being said. There are different statuses of relationship, and I mentioned that earlier, and those things need to certainly be considered. 
There are different statuses of relationship. There are strangers. There are new acquaintances. There are old friends. And there are family. And how we greet strangers is going to be different than how we greet family. How we greet new acquaintances is going to be different than how we greet old friends. But the really important thing here is how do we greet people with different statuses? Do we greet them at all? Do I only greet family and old friends or do I greet strangers and new acquaintances? When I greet strangers and new acquaintances, do I greet them with an, with an open door or a closed door? Do I greet them in love or do I greet them just because it's a formality? Do I greet them so we can grow in relationship and move our relationship forward or so I can just keep it right where it is? So I recognize that how you greet people is going to look different depending on the status. But I think we should always be thinking, here's a stranger. I'm going to greet this stranger and with an open door that our relationship might be moved to a new acquaintance. I'm going to greet this new acquaintance with love so that our relationship could be moved to old friend. I'm going to greet this old friend so that our relationship can be even deeper and deeper. Seeing people as God does calls us to greet everyone thoughtfully with love and I think with open arms to move closer in relationship. As Christians, we are ambassadors for Christ, displaying the love of Christ to others. Now, Peter says, greet one another. How many are included in that one another? How many, do you think? Do you think anyone is excluded in that when you come to church? Greet one another, except those people, with a kiss of love, right? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul tells us to greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Here, here's a challenge for us. I'd like to challenge you to make an effort to greet everyone at church when you come. Now, I know that's not going to happen, okay? Uh, I know from experience that's not going to happen. People have to go. You have to go. And there's only so much time and only so long you can talk to people. But make an effort. That is, have it in your heart that were everyone to stay put for five, six hours after church, you'd greet everybody. Okay? And that as long as people are here, you're kind of constantly making the rounds and greeting people because the Bible says, greet one another with a kiss of love and greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And every single person is valuable to God and should be valuable to you. These are, if, if, if we are Christians, these are your brothers and sisters. And to love your brothers and sisters is actually to love God, the Bible tells us. I think we should also greet non-Christians or new people that we don't know are Christians when they come to church. When a church is a church of genuine recognition and welcome, where everyone is seeing one another and greeting one another, Brothers and sisters, that church is a powerful force of the love of Christ. True or false? Brothers and sisters, a congregation that greets somebody is more powerful than a single individual that, greet, that, uh, that greets someone. I want you to imagine a visitor who comes into church, first time here. And I want you to imagine that one person is very friendly to them. Okay, That's good. One person is friendly to them. Versus, everyone is friendly to them. Now, in the first case, when that person leaves church, they think, there was someone in that church that was friendly. That was kind of cool. That guy's, or girl's, friendly and welcoming. Versus, that place, that group, that congregation is a place where I felt welcomed and where I could belong. And furthermore, when the congregation welcomes a new person, what that tells the new person is, the reason why I was welcomed wasn't just a personality thing, right? Because if one person is really welcoming to them, they might say, that one person was just a friendly, welcoming personality. But if everybody welcomes them, then they think, there's got to be something going on among this group of people that's bigger than just personality, right? 
What these people believe <laughs> is making a difference. It's not just personality, but the truth that's different here. The ministry of greeting that we have, and we have, um, it's an extremely important ministry. I hope you realize, based you know, from what we've seen in the Bible, that we have greeters. When someone comes in the door, they're right there to greet them. That's extremely important. But I'd like to challenge you that it's not enough. Greeting doesn't stop with the person who's assigned to greet at the door. And all of us should be looking for, is there anyone new here? We should be aware that we can go and extend to them the welcome of Christ. What an incredible difference that will make. Another aspect of greeting one another is this. 3 John chapter 1, verse 15, John says, Greet the friends by name. So one important thing in greeting one another is learning each other's names. Because learning each other's names shows you care. Now, I don't know everyone's names here, and I want to learn everyone's names. It's taking me a little bit of time. But I want to. And everyone should want to. The Bible commands it that you greet everyone by name. And if you have a hard times with names, well, then you better figure out some way to deal with that, right? Because the Bible commands it. Knowing a person's name shows you care because a name is very important to someone. Here's another challenge. In order to greet one another with the kiss of love, you have to initiate. You have to initiate. You can't wait until the church is friendlier before you greet one another. You greet each other to make it friendlier. So if you're thinking, well, I'll get into this, Eli, when things start changing around here. Well, if everyone thought that way, nothing would change. See, friends, this isn't a command that you have to wait to fulfill. The worst, most inhospitable church can immediately begin to fulfill this command to greet one another. Initiating is serving others. It's not playing it safe. It's not saying, I'm going to wait for someone else to come to me first. Because when we're doing that, when we're sit, kind of sitting in the corner, how come no one is greeting me, right? We're actually acting very selfishly. We're either too afraid to initiate or we just want people to think about us. But greeting one, one another in love, true biblical greeting is actually thinking of others as more important than yourself. And aren't you glad Jesus initiated with you? Aren't you glad Jesus didn't sit back and say, well, I'll just wait for him to come to me, right? But as the Bible tells us, God did not wait for while we were yet sinners and enemies and helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. We did not deserve it. God had every reason not to come to us and welcome. He had every reason not to recognize and welcome you, and he did because of his love. And this is what we are called to do. Why do we do this? We do this because God did this. We do this because this is the nature of God. And as Christians, we are simply passing along what we have received and showing to others the great gift that we have enjoyed. The gospel is that even though you hated him and were running from God, God sent his son into the world and he died on the cross for your sins. He did, he took the steps to remove all the, the boundaries and the obstacles. All your sins that separate you from God and that earn you eternal damnation, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, took all of those sins upon himself and paid the price and satisfied the justice of God so that you could come to God and be forgiven and have eternal life as a free gift, something you don't have to work for or earn, simply by believing and accepting by faith what he's done for you. This shows us how much God loves us. This is the kind of love that we know and that we can share as Christians. And it's wonderful, isn't it? If our church can recapture the vision of the great love of Christ and express that to one another through the simple yet profound act of greeting, there is no telling what will happen. What's in a greeting? 
That depends. Nothing really, if you don't think about it, if you don't listen to what the Bible has to say, if you don't allow yourself to be changed by the love of Christ and share that. But if we do see what's really in a greeting, according to the Bible, that simple act makes all the difference. May God's glory be displayed in his church through Jesus Christ. Please stand with me as I pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for your great love. It's sometimes so hard to realize, Lord, how unspeakably loved we are by you and to grasp the amazing grace of it all. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning as we are reflecting on how we may serve one another in this church, that before all things, it begins with greeting and seeing each other as you see us and being welcoming. I pray, Lord, that today would be the day of change. I pray that if we are hearing your voice through the preaching of your word, that we would not shut that down, but we would respond to it. And Father, I pray that as we enter this new year, 2018 would be a year where we grow and increase in our love for one another and that our community sees that and that many people are brought into this community, Lord, of your love. So glorify your name, Lord, through the truth of the gospel and through the love that we express to each other. And it all comes back to you, God, the great and awesome and wonderful and holy God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For a moment. As we've heard, you know, this today we're doing what we're calling our, our ministry fair. We're not going to have as much time as I would like to have you do this. So what we're going to do is if you find, hopefully everybody, I know everybody, got, they got a bolt and got one. If you uh, also maybe were handed one of these. Um, where's Chris at? Chris, do we still have some extras of these? So Grab one of these from Chris as you go out. What, the reason it's important, because we don't have much time, what I'd like you to do is look through this and figure out who would I like to stop and talk to. Now, we're going to take a brief amount of time to do that now, then when we get done, um, those, when we get done with communion and end of service, uh, if you're leading one of the tables, I'd like you to make your way back to the table. Uh, don't stop and linger here. Don't greet anybody. Um, go back to your table. Um, because as we get ready for our potluck, I'd like uh, there to be opportunity in case any of you need to, to take out. But, but what we're going to do is we're going to try to take a few minutes. Uh, we'll flash the lights. Um, the, the worship team will start um, with a song. And when you hear the music and the lights and you can come back in, then you have a chance. The purpose is to figure out if you're new, to figure out who are these guys. If you've been around for a while, how can I, where can I fit in, as Eli said um, and like I said, there's different places here. Make sure you find me as you're coming back in. I'll be right by the table. I have a gift for you. I have the uh, directory. If you'd like your name in there, I'd like you to check that. But make sure you find me because I have a little devotional book for you. Uh, so don't, don't come back in or don't leave without talking to me as well. But with that, let's, um, the people at the tables, you can find your way back to your table. Feel free to stop by. Uh, look through your sheet, um, see where you might want to volunteer, get more information, and you're on your own for about 10 minutes, and we'll get back together here in a second.
<laughs> just straight. Straight. So I'm going to do this. Breakfast. I'm going to do this. I was trying to guide my kids to sign up for something. There you go. That's way too short. The weird instruction is we got to have a Yeah. We're supposed to be playing, right, honey? Okay, I don't think this is plugged. I don't know. Maybe I do. What, what song are we doing today? Well, she's not playing that song. Okay. Go ahead and be seated, please. Uh, well, this morning, you know, we, we have a lot going on. If you're visiting, you know, it's, we apologize for going a little bit longer than we had uh, planned. But communion is an important part of the community activity that we share in, in Christ. And one of the things that I oftentimes will mention in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, we find the image of how where we get this idea of breaking from the single body that we all share in together in Christ. And so we participate together in that single body. We're joined together as one family in God. And so that's the symbolism behind what we do. And we normally have you come forward, but today we're going to have you pass the elements down the rows. Uh, part of the reason is we want you to be reminding one another that this is Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood shed for you. And as you minister to the person to your right on this side, your left on this side, and then vice versa as you pass it around, we want you to remind one another of what it is that we are celebrating. And so you'll stay in your, your pew today, and uh, Michael and Matt and I will help uh, pass, pass them down the rows for you. But we want to begin by a simple reminder from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, of what it is that we do, what it is that we are celebrating um, this morning as we take communion. It begins in verse 23, where 
This is what Paul tells us. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he broke it, he gave thanks, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, as we take the, the bread, as we celebrate what Christ has done, we take the single loaf and we break it, and as you participate together with us as we take that as well to remember what Christ has done. And then on in verse, the next verses, we find uh, Paul saying this in verse 25, in the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me, for as often you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so we often like to give you a chance to just um, meditate and remember what Christ has done for you. And so as you prepare to take this, just give a second and give God thanks for what he has done. As I said, you'll just pass it down the aisle and one of us will pick it up and pass it behind you. So let me pray for us and then we'll celebrate what God has done. Lord, we do celebrate together as a church, as a family of believers, of what you have done for us. Lord, we celebrate this not only for us individually, but for us corporately as your church. We remember what you have done. Amen. Yeah, just go ahead and hold them and we'll take it together. I'm sorry.
as we said, this is truly a celebration for us. We celebrate what Christ has done. It begins by partaking of the body was broken for us, for our sins. A sacrifice was made. So let us eat together. As Paul writes, after supper, the blood that was shed, the blood that makes us white as snow was shed for us. Let us drink this together as well. And we have a final closing song. Please stand and worship with us. Lord, again, I thank you for this day that we've had to gather together as your people. May we remember the word that we've been encouraged with of welcoming one another as you have welcomed us, to greet one another, Lord, as brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for the reminders we've had. Go with us. Amen. So stay around. Again, if you're leading one of the tables, please make your way back there. Stay for lunch if you can. In about 10 minutes or so, we'll gather together. Thanks for your time with us today. Go in God's peace.